in our camera lens now he knows this climb very well he's been successful on it before not as a win but a high finish and that was last year in the route de sud and now patrick is going to hurt it he's towing up there the champions of holland and france jalabert to the right and uh, bogart to our left as we look but the man in yellow he doesn't normally see this part of the peloton on a climb paul he must have realized there's a little bit of a traffic jam down there now as he tries to pick his way through and you know you know, I've got a feeling that the pressure is beginning to tell here on Ulrich. The gaps are yo-yoing a little bit. Hi everyone, we've got Patrick Yonker. Patrick Yonker rode in, oh, what, early 90s? Yes. Early 90s, and he's famous for being around 1996. Yep, that's right. He got 12th or 13th. Yeah, 12th, yeah. Place in few field. people have been disqualified since, and um, move up the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you do it. That's how you do it, yeah. Protest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, protest. <laughs> We've got some questions for Patrick here. Now, someone sent us some questions. Who was the rider that most impressed you that you've ever met? Um, Not most locally, impressive. Here. <laughs> no, well, obviously, uh, probably be two people. Uh, obviously, Eddie Merckx was the greatest cyclist that we've ever had. And obviously Miguel Indrain, who I raced against. So the person I most admire and really look up to would definitely be Eddie Merckx as a person and as an athlete. But um, yeah, Miguel Indrain, who from Spain, whose physiology is just out of this world. I mean, it's almost like he's extraterrestrial. They uh, yeah. called him ET. <laughs> so his heart is so big. Um, like a racehorse, like a Maccabi Diva or Farlap, you know, his heart will be 28 times a minute to pump blood around his body. Whoa. And then his maximum heart rate of Indurain would be 190, I don't know, 5 or 98, which he has ability to pump around 20 litres of blood wow, around the body. So these guys are physiological freaks of nature. In a way, they're mutants in a way. Um, but both Miguel Indurain and Eddie Merckx would be two of the nicest people. I guess if you're gifted like that in life, and then they have that mental focus and determination, then you have a complete package. So, um, the Eddie Merckx, who have ridden with training-wise a few times, I know, and, and Miguel Indurain, who are raced against. Yeah. There you go, we can work really hard to, to be good cyclists, but if you've got genetics, it plays a big part. So 1995, 96, we saw some pretty insane sort of bikes coming out, didn't we? Yeah. There was the, it was sort of the era between steel coming to carbon fibre. Well, there was aluminium as well, the yeah. Vitus bikes. Then they had all the aero bikes that they had. Yeah. Titanium started to come in, although it's been around for a while. And, uh, yeah, the funny bikes. Did you, <laughs> ever ride, did you ride one of those funny bikes? Yeah, yeah. so, yeah... There was a time when the UCI had no, regulate, no regulations on the design of a bicycle. So it was open play, you know, it was game on for the designers to design super aerodynamic uh, bikes. And I was riding for a Spanish team who was uh, one of the leaders, uh, number one team in the world. So they had the funds to, to build the most aerodynamic bikes uh, possible and that were the look uh, KG uh, time trial bikes with a small front wheel, so it had a 26 inch front wheel and um, very compact, very aerodynamic. And that was the, the look monocoque KG um, time trial bike. There'll be people out there who could tell you exact model, etc. Yeah. You could look up on the internet. Yeah. But yeah, we were in an era where we uh, would have a time trial in the Tour de France where you'd have a bike that would be specifically made just for an uphill time trial and you couldn't ride downhill with it. Uh. I'd be weighing maybe five and a half kilograms and composite materials or titanium, very small front wheel, larger back wheel, 180 mil cranks. I had anything you could think of was, 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 uh, was, was a go. Um, and then eventually I may, may have gotten out of hand a bit and the UCI, the governing body, put a stop to all these space age and materials and, uh, and and bikes but for a particular amount of time it was a lot of fun to be a, a, a bike racer because you had this equipment that was just 
state of the art space age equipment. Yeah. It's funny that you know even nowadays the equipment isn't doesn't seem as far no. advanced as it was in the no mid 90s no. because uh, they put a stop on development. Yeah. Because even the weight of the bikes, what we got, six point eight. Which is quite heavy for a bike, to be honest. Yeah. So um, that's just something which I believe they should change. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're thinking of, I think. Mm. Yeah. So there you go. We can have really light bikes if you race back then, but now, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can have cameras and these other more the paraphernalia that can be included in your six point eight. Apparently. So what did you find uh, would be your favourite, well, maybe not your favourite, but yeah. your strongest, where you were strongest, like for hill climbing, yeah. for time trialling, sprinting? So it would be a combination, bicycle. basically I got paid to climb a bicycle up a hill fast and to time trial fast, that's what I make a living living out of for, for quite a while and uh, I wasn't the best climber but I was good enough to help the, the better climbers get to the last climb in the best possible physical condition in order to let the genetics play their role and off they go. So um, my um, strongest point was uh, ability to uh, yeah, climb time trial and pretty much, to be honest, just sacrifice myself for riders who are a bit better than me and who could finish the job off. The, the, the winners, you know, the big big name riders like Alex Zula and Laurent Jalabert and yeah. Sorensen and, and those guys who I rode for for, for several years and uh, got paid to um, do a particular job and that was sit in the front on the climbs and go as hard as I possibly can. Yeah, so you go, the unsung heroes. Yeah, the forgotten <laughs> ones. The forgotten. <laughs> so what do you think is the most important achievement that you had? The um, thing that you well, excelled at? Yeah, well climbing again, so uh, I won the Rue de Sud, was a four day race in the Pyrenees just before the Tour de France. So typically all the Tour de France contenders go and race in the big races like Tour de Switzerland and Dauphiné and then after that one little four day race in the Pyrenees called the Route de Sud or they used to call it Route de Midi Pyrenees and uh, I won that uh, in 97 and uh, that was one of the biggest wins uh, um, together with the Tour Down Under of course because to win the Tour Down Under um, in, your home, in your home territory <laughs> is something that right never really happens to anybody so that was yeah. definitely one of the highlights but uh, yeah ruled the suit in the midi in the pyrenees against you know the, the best riders in the best form was definitely uh, one of one of the biggest wins together with a with a tour down under yeah. yeah tour down under got to come to the tour down under yeah. really good every year lovely weather here in australia come to the tour down under zula you mentioned zula how about ulrich yeah, Jan Ulrich, Jan Ulrich was a um, bit of a phenomenon in cycling. Jan Ulrich was this phys physically imposing character. We had massive thighs and glutes and his hamstrings would be like steel cables that hold the ship's, that, that an <laughs> ship's anchor. So his legs were like steel cables oh. where you could see every vein mm. and every muscle fibre Wow. And he was a product of the East German regime and was put into like a sports institution as a 12 year old and was wow. kind of uh, um, pretty much very similar to the Rocky movie where Rocky against Dolph Lundgren. Sounds like a Frankenstein science project. <laughs> yeah, they talk about that as well. But, um, you know, people familiar with the USSR and East Germany and the older generation would remember the Soviet Union yeah. and uh, the athletes that came out. Jan Ulrich was uh, the last of the product of the East uh, who um, was yeah, grew up in a sports institution and was basically bred to become a superior athlete <laughs> to represent the East. And uh, then the war came down and obviously he was, became a Western athlete very quickly. Yeah. And uh, um, Jan Ulrich is... Um, a great guy, I know him very well, and an amazing athlete, uh, Tour de France winner, Olympic champion, and he's done a lot of amazing things. Yeah. Um, I would say, in when I think memorized, the, you know, think back, um, yeah, he was, he was, uh, you could say, the poster boy of the East. Oh, uh, right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the Germans, they breed him tough as well. He's Germans. Yep, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Henry Armstrong. 
Yeah. You don't have to talk about. I'm yeah, sorry. everyone has to talk about. Everyone Lance. has to talk about Lance. Everyone has an opinion. <laughs> I mean, now that Donald Trump is president of the United States of America, how yeah. can you? Yeah. yeah what a, this is the world we live in. Yeah. So. Yeah. And and forgive and forget. Uh, maybe not. No. No. I don't okay. Think so. yeah. But you, bro, no. you he, you were in his team for a while. I know Lance Armstrong very well. I know a lot of the Tour de France winners or yeah. from the nineties. Became, you know, good friends, yeah. And uh, Lance was a good friend, yeah. And uh, I still, you know, if I run into him somewhere, I'll still say hello, yeah. Um, but yeah, there's I think the damage caused to the sport was not just one person, no, it wasn't no, Lance no. Armstrong who invented the drugs, no, it was Lance who uh, perfected it and mm, uh, right. exploited it. But he was not the main, you can't just blame one person for. Uh, a generation of, uh, mm. of problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly, certainly took cycling to uh, to low. focus on where well, new low focus on America. Greg LeMond really, Greg yeah. LeMond really focused on America. He he brought it up for America. Yeah, he was the first time three time three triple yeah. triple champion. <coughs> Lance, Lance, he's coming back too. I don't know if he's going to be a professional cycling. No, but he likes a triathlon yeah. scene. Yeah, yeah. Well, good on him. Good on him. You know, anyone who rides these, you've got to be tough. With drugs or not, you've got to be tough in this sport. Anyway. Sure. <laughs> yeah, that's the question that's going to remain in everyone's uh, mind forever. Um, you know, uh, had it been an even playing field, or yeah. would Auric yeah. have won four or five? Or would have, uh, you know, who would have won? You know, who would have dominated that era had it been mm. like it is today? Mm. Like today, we could say it's completely clean. Yeah. And, you know, who would have been the most dominant rider and, and a lot of people think that you know, had it been an even playing field uh, Lance would still have won several Tour de France yeah. probably not seven yeah. but uh, uh, but it's the time I think a lot of people just like to sit behind and forget and look at the future yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so you still ride you got a family yep. and you still ride you have to come out with us riding this morning blitzed us on the hills <laughs> I couldn't keep up so you still got it, still rides. I think uh, <laughs> cycling is just good for everything, really. Health, well-being, yeah. good for your body, good for your mind, good for the environment. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned in Europe now. We're in Australia, but in Europe, a lot of well, e-bikes, e-bikes yeah. are taking off. Yeah, look. And there's so much traffic everywhere in the condensed cities like Amsterdam. Oh, in Northern, yeah, Northern Europe, there's no way you can't drive anywhere in the big cities. Yeah. And a lot of the big cities in Europe, Berlin, Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Paris, the future is bicycles, bi public transport, yeah. and uh, alternative forms of transport because the days of the motor vehicle in the places like Amsterdam, only a couple uh, last week they had 600 kilometres of traffic jam, so there's just no future. In Australia, we're fortunate here, we're not going to hopefully see anything like that, but uh, uh, the future is definitely uh, the bike to form of transport to go from A to B. Yeah. There's so much to choose from. There you go, Patrick Yonker. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's really nice. And we'll catch you guys on the other end of the screen. If you want to come to, to the tour down under, definitely do so. Come and meet us, and we'd love to meet you. Cheers for now.